In section 1.2, we're going to describe the basic properties of each physical state of matter, uh, whether it be solid, liquid, or gas. We're going to distinguish the dip between mass and weight. What is the difference between those two? We'll apply the law of conservation of matter, and we'll classify matter as either an element, a compound, heterogeneous mixture, or a homogeneous mixture with regard to its physical state and composition. And finally, we'll define and give examples of both atoms and molecules. So matter, matter is a substance that occupies space, has mass, and is composed predominantly of atoms. Atoms themselves consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons that constitute the observable universe and that is interconvertible with energy. The substance, uh, the second definition we could use is a little bit more general, the substance of which a physical object is composed, uh, or a material substance of a particular kind or for a particular purpose. So when we talk about matter and chemistry, we're really using this top definition here, um, but you can see that matter is used a little bit more generically in everyday language uh, with the second and third definition. Matter comes in different phases, um, and it's best to just kind of get jump into what the different phases are so you can see exactly what a phase is. So a solid is a rigid uh, phase of matter that possesses a definite shape. So if you have a solid, it does not expand at all. It has a definite shape. For instance, this is a cube here. Um, and it's not going to take the shape of its container or anything. It's just going to stay a cube. A liquid flows and takes the shape of its container. So if we have a liquid, it doesn't expand to fill the container either, but it does change its shape to fill the bottom of the container. It's going to uh, be able to flow and change its shape as it, depending on what container you put it in. Um, and it can move and flow from one area to another. It's always going to go with gravity. And a gas takes both the shape and the volume of its container. So if I put a sample of gas inside of a, a container, even if it's smaller than that container, it's going to expand and fill the entirety of the inside of the chamber. A somewhat less common but uh, distinct phase of matter is something called plasma. And what plasma is, is basically if you keep dumping energy into a gas, you wind up with a gaseous state of matter that contains an appreciable amount of electrically charged particles. Um, it has unique properties distinct from other gases, and uh, it can be found in certain high energy, high temperature environments. Okay, so naturally there's plasma inside of stars, Lightning produces plasma, and we use it in a number of man-made applications. Like there used to be plasma television screens were very popular for a while. This is a plasma torch here, um, and we use plasma pretty extensively now in a lot of industrial applications to like treat surfaces uh, to give them specific properties. Mass versus weight. So this is kind of a confusing thing because we tend to use these terms interchangeably. But mass is a measure of the amount of matter inside of an object. So this weight here, for instance, uh, this standard has a certain amount of mass. <clears throat> where weight refers to the force that gravity exerts on an object. So when we try and figure out how much mass something has, the best way we have to do that is to weigh it, to see how much gravity is pulling on it in order to determine how much mass there is. The problem with that is that the force of gravity is pretty constant, but not completely constant. It actually depends on how far away from the center of the Earth you are. So if you're at sea level, for instance, you're going to have more gravity than if you were at the very top of a mountain. So the something with the same amount of mass is going to weigh slightly differently on those two things, on those two places. Uh, and the only way to get around that is to calibrate your weighing device for uh, the area where you're at. So you set up your weighing device wherever you're at. You take something like this uh, standard weight here that you know what its mass is. And then you calibrate this device so that it correlates the force that it's feeling on it with the appropriate amount of mass. 
Uh, this brings us to the law of conservation of matter, which states that there is no detectable change in the total quantity of matter present when matter converts from one type to another. Uh, and this is true for both chemical and physical changes. So here, for instance, we have a chemical change. If you think about like a fermenting beer, you have a closed system here and you have sugar and you have, you know, the water and the rest of the stuff that the beer is made out of. And what's going to happen is you're going to have yeast convert that over to that sugar over to ethanol. But you still have the same amount of matter in there. If I weigh this bottle before and after, even though they now contain different things, they're going to weigh the same amount. They're going to have the same amount of mass inside of them. Uh, another example would be like a car battery over here. Uh, what happens is during the process of releasing energy, electrical energy, you're going to have uh, lead get converted over to uh, lead sulfate and water. But if I weigh the battery before and after, even though they have different states before and after, um, they're going to weigh the exact same amount. Okay, For every bit of lead sulfate that gets produced, you're going to consume some lead and hydrochloric or sulfuric acid. Elements. So an element is a type of pure substance that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical changes. There are more than 100 known elements. Uh, 90 of these occur naturally, and two dozen or so have been created in laboratories. And they're all uh, contained within the periodic table. This is a, a table of all of our elements that we've discovered so far. And we've pretty much filled this out. Uh, because if you look from the top here to the lightest one of hydrogen, we go down. These are all of our naturally occurring ones. And then down here at the bottom, we have some that uh, become less and less common, and then eventually radioactive ones that we've only ever produced in laboratories and stuff like that with like particle accelerators. And we got down here to this very last corner down here. We already know this guy. And so to add any more, we would actually have to start a whole new row. And it's pretty clear to scientists that even if this is possible they're not going to be stable they're not something that's found in nature or anything like that so we may have now discovered all of the known feasible elements which is quite the accomplishment actually uh everything is made of elements so everything that we have is made some out uh, of some combination of those elements um if you take a look at a uh, cell phone you have polymers so uh these are plastics such as uh, abs um and then you have the different metals that are made out of alloys and stuff um, aluminum iron and magnesium are elements and alloys will be some combination of those to put together uh, you have the processors, which are made out of silicone, copper, tin, gold, and even some rare ones like ytterbium and, and gadolinium. Uh, you have the screen components, which are made out of uh, glass, aluminum, sodium, and potassium. And then you have the batteries that are made out of lithium and cobalt, iron, and copper. Uh, so almost one third of the naturally occurring elements are used to make up a cell phone, which is kind of interesting. Like we really figured out how to combine these together to make different um, products and uh, materials and stuff. So elements versus compounds, and this is an important distinction. So both are pure substances, um, meaning that they have a constant composition for, throughout. If you take out, if you had a sample of an element and you had a sample of a compound and you took out any little piece of it, it's going to be the same as the whole. That's what a pure substance means. Um, so elements are pure substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical changes. Okay. They consist of just one type of element. Examples are the ones that are on the periodic table, gold, phosphorus, oxygen, and etc. Compounds are pure substances that can be broken down into simpler substances by chemical changes. So these are compounds are uh, what happens when we take elements and we combine them together chemically. All right, they consist of two or more types of elements chemically bounded, bound, 
Uh, and examples could be water, uh, sugar, C6H6O6, or uh, gold chloride. The properties of the compounds are different from the uncombined elements making up the compound. So you can get distinct properties by putting the compounds together, and that's how we get such a myriad of different things that we observe in the real world, even though we have only a finite number of elements, is we can combine them together chemically to produce compounds. Here's an example of uh, a compound being broken down over a Bunsen burner. Here where we heat mercury oxide, it decomposes down into the mercury, the silver liquid down there at the bottom and uh, oxygen gas that's gonna go up and fill the container. So now that brings us to mixtures. A mixture is comprised of two or more types of matter, elements or compounds that are, can be present in varying amounts. So the components of a mixture can be separated by physical changes, evaporation, dissolution, this is like when you dissolve something, crystallization, this is when something comes out of uh, like a liquid solution and becomes a solid, uh, diffusion, which we'll talk about in chapter 9. Um, and there are two types of mixtures, homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. So basically, mixtures are what happen when you combine together elements or compounds, but they're not chemically bonded to one another. The two types of mixtures that we're going to have are a homogeneous mixture. This exhibits a uniform composition and appears visually the same throughout. Uh, another name for a homogeneous mixture is a solution. So um, one example of that would be like a Gatorade kind of container, right? If you take out any sample and you take a look at it, it looks like it's completely uniform throughout, but it's actually a mixture of sugar and water and dye and stuff like that. A heterogeneous mixture has a composition that varies from point to point. Um, so here they have the example of some salad dressing. You know, you have some vinegar sitting at the bottom. You have some oil at the top. You may have some spices uh, floating around in there. And if you took a little sample out, you'd actually be able to see that it is not consistent throughout the entire mixture. So I really like this flow chart as a way of distinguishing um, the different kinds of matter we've been talking about so far. You start off with matter as distinct from energy. Um, and the first question you ask yourself is, does it have a constant properties and composition? And if that's not true, you get a no, well then it's some kind of mixture. And then the next question you ask yourself is, is it uniform throughout? You know, is, is every piece just like every other part of it? If the answer is no, then you have something heterogeneous, like the salad dressing we saw. And if the answer is yes, then you have a homogeneous mixture. Now, if it does have a constant properties and compositions, then you have a pure substance. And then you ask yourself, well, can it be broken down any further um, and simplified chemically? And if the answer is no, then you have an element. And if the answer is yes, then you wind up with a compound. So all of this matter we've been talking about so far is made out of atoms and molecules. Um, and atoms are the smallest particles of an element that has the properties of that element and can enter into a chemical comp combination. This idea has been around for a really long time, going all the way back to very early Greek philosophers like Leucippus and Democrat. Democritus, Democritus, in the 5th century uh, BC. In the 19th century, John Dalton of England supported his hypothesis that there were atoms with some quantitative measurements, and we're going to talk a little bit more about him in the next chapter. And then we have molecules, and this consists of two or more atoms connected by strong forces known as chemical bonds. So we have the atoms that make up all of the elements, and then when we combine them together with chemical bonds, we can form molecules, and molecules are what make up compounds. Uh, for a long time, it was just the idea of an atom was just theoretical, but we've actually gotten down to a point where we can actually see these now using like microscopy and stuff like uh, scanning, scanning tunneling microscopes, um, 
other uh, microscopes that actually use electrons that we'll learn about um, a little later to visualize them. So here we can see a string of gold atoms all together. Uh, as you can see that there's like this striation pattern that's kind of like a grain to the overall metal and then where it's pressed up you can start to see the individual atoms. We have a lot of ways of symbolizing molecules. Uh, one of the more common ones is this like ball method here uh, where each atom is represented by a ball of a different shape and size and then you can see that they overlap a little bit to indicate that they're chemically bound together. So this would be hydrogen, we have oxygen, phosphorus, P4, so you have four phosphorus atoms. Uh, sulfur can uh, exist as a polymer, S8, you can see a string of those together. We have water molecules, so now we have one of these oxygens bound to two of the hydrogens. Uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, we have one carbon atom bound to two oxygens. And then these can get to be really elaborate structures like this uh, one here for glucose. This is uh, a simple sugar that your body's made out of. Your body's made out of really complex um, molecules. Uh, most of them are some form of polymer.